In her book, Parable of the Sower, Octavia Butler shares the verses that the young narrator, Lauren Olamina, writes throughout, and Lauren calls these earth seed. And Lauren is working out a relation, a change from who she has been in her father's rather traditional church in, a, in this dystopian landscape. But her father is a preacher in an old school kind of church, and Lauren is working out a new thing, a new way of understanding ultimate reality. So this is the, the beginning verse of Earth Seed, and I want you to hear the word God in this verse as ultimate reality, not as supreme being, but as ultimate reality. All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. Throughout her work, throughout all of her work, but especially in the parable series, Octavia Butler lifts up change as the only lasting truth. In in the parable of the sower and then subsequently in the parable of the talents, a strong man has risen to power as president in the United States. And climate change is decimating the environment. The economy is falling apart. Income inequality is out of control. Resources are scarce. And violence has forced people to isolate. Hmm, how fantastical would that be? It's quite something. 1996, I believe she wrote Parable of the Sower. And it is so, it's not even prescient. What she said, what Butler said, is that she followed what was currently happening in the world out to its logical conclusion. We sometimes see the great changes that are happening in our society, in our democracy, on our planet, as immediate, it wasn't this way three years ago, but the changes are, have been coming for a long time. So our theme this month is on the path of change. And I wanna spend a little time this morning talking about changes, all of the cha-cha-cha changes in our bodies, in our minds, in our civic life, changes on the planet, changes in our congregation. I want to start first with the idea of neuroplasticity, right? So when I look around among us, there are people who are, I'm, I just turned 60. There are plenty of us who are older than me and plenty of us who are younger than me. We are all somewhere in this long series of changes that is our lifetime. Our lifetime is a series of moments and changes. So the young ones, the very young ones, are just changing at a, just the fastest pace. Jacob, our wonderful uh, tech uh, director, has a brand new baby. And Trinidad's brains are just flashing and firing all over the place. No wonder he can't sleep at night. <laughs> He's just, man, so much is happening in that brain. The most that will ever happen in Trinidad's brain is happening right now because he's an infant, right? He's growing all those neurons. You ever notice how a baby's head is a little bit too big for its body? It's got to, man, it's got to hold that brain. But for every one of us, for our young ones who left, their bodies are going through incredible changes. I remember when our daughter entered uh, middle school, the, one of the welcome nights, they said, your kid is going through as much change now as they did when they were a baby, right? Changes in your body, changes in your hormones, changes in all the things, changes in mood, all of that neurodevelopment. As we get older, the changes slow down, and sometimes we can get stuck in our patterns of thinking. 
right? Well, it's just the way it is. That's the way I learned it. That's the way it is. That's how I deal with things. Everything's fine. <laughs> oh, that rang true. <laughs> Neuroplasticity is the term that's, that's used to define that early uh, activity in the brain and also the way we change after trauma to the brain, right? For someone who's suffered a, uh, a stroke or other neurological incident, we relearn and rewire some of those pathways. Neuroplasticity, it, our, our brain is malleable. According to the website Health transformers.co. Neural pathways are comprised of neurons connected by dendrites, and they're created in the brain based on our habits and behaviors. The number of dendrites increases with the frequency of the behavior performed, right? So our brain cells communicate with each other via these processes called neural firing neuronal firing, and so the more we do something, the more it fires. Brain cells communicate frequently, and the connections between them strengthens, and the messages that travel the same pathway in the brain over and over again begin to transmit faster and faster. With enough repetition, these pathways become automatic. So reading, driving, riding a bike, those are examples of complicated behaviors that we eventually can do automatically because we practice them over and over. Remember when you were a new driver, those of you who drive, remember when you were a new driver? Man, you had to think about everything, right? And the more you do it, the more you can relax and not just become one tense nerve because you do it more and more, and all of those things work together and they become more automatic. <laughs> Gotta have it. Yeah. In a book called Hardwiring Happiness, neuropsy a neuropsychologist explains that our brains are wired toward the negative. Right? For example, like if you have 10 experiences during the day, let's say five of them are neutral, four positive experiences and one negative experience, what's the one you're going to think about when you go to bed at night? Right? The negative one. Right? Our brains are hardwired toward the negative because when we were, um, New, brand new humans, I mean, not babies, but way back in the beginning of uh, what, as humans were developing, the negative experiences could kill you, right? So we had to focus on those. But we're not stuck with that. That's where neuroplasticity comes in, right? So how can we change our brains to focus on the good experiences? Well, this book, Hardwiring Happiness, gives practical advice for this. One strategy is to focus on the good for 10 to 20 seconds, like really absorbing it and storing the experience in our long-term memory. So you might see a, a beautiful view or a beautiful sunset and go, oh yeah, that's really pretty, that's nice. What's next on my list? But by really allowing it in, letting in positive experiences, focusing on them, storing them in our memory, and returning to them as a practice, we create those neuronal pathways. We are not stuck with focusing on the negative. We can do some training with our brains to focus on the positive. I am um, loving this new book by UU Minister Karen Herring, and I'll leave it on the welcome table outside so you can take a look at it. It's called Trusting Change. Trusting Change. And she talks about three 
qualities of change that are worth keeping in mind that both bear on what's happening within us, in our own lives, the changes that happen in our lives, in our bodies, in our families, in our congregation, in our community, in the world, on the planet, right? She says that these qualities can apply at anywhere in those, what I think of as concentric circles. The three qualities that she talks about are that change echoes. So the changes that are happening in me are amplified by the changes that are happening around me. And conversely, the changes that are happening around me exacerbate or soothe, perhaps, the changes that are happening in me. If you are undergoing a great change yourself, if you've lost your partner, if you are uh, an, an empty nester this year for the first time, if you are getting ready to graduate and go to college, or getting ready to graduate and get a job or have your first apartment, or your relationship is like that. <laughs> you know that, yeah. right? <laughs> Those changes that are happening in our own lives can be exacerbated by the great and fast societal change that we feel around us, right? If you're having issues in your own life, COVID may have just knocked you on your butt. It did for many of us living through this pandemic, this great change of that nothing was the same. And we're just now beginning to realize how much changed for us. That is exacerbated by what's happening in your own life. Does that make sense? The echo from inside to the greater world and vice versa. I can't take another shoe to drop in our civic life. I've got too much. I can't stand it. It echoes throughout us. Change echoes. She says, two, participating in change is a shared task. We do so well as humans who are made for connection to participate in change together. And if I am undergoing this change, the loss of a beloved friend or um, a change in my job, I'm not the only one who's ever done that. Someone else in this room has experienced that. And when I reach out and open to what that change is, then I get strength and experience from someone else and hope. And also, when we want to change society in a certain direction, we do it together. We dare not try to do it on our own. That way, madness lies. And the third thing she says, Karen Herring says, is change is embodied. Change is embodied. These are words that I often share at memorial services. These are the words of Minister Kate Tucker. And she says it helps to understand that grief and loss and great change will take you on an unpredictable journey and that a change is a thing that happens in your body, not just in your soul she says, not just in your mind or spirit. It happens in your body. From the beginning of our lives as babies to now, think about this. Not, I think I'm right about the science, not a single cell in our bodies is the same one that we were born with. Cells are replaced regenerated all the time, every bit of us. We're all about change all the time, and yet our essential sense of self remains the same. Isn't that something? In Trusting Change, Karen offers 10 skills for navigating dramatic changes that happen in our lives and in our world. So these skills apply to both the 
most innermost circle and the largest circle in, that, in those rings of concentric circles. Letting go, letting go of what was. That caterpillar has to let go of caterpillar life to become the goo, to become the butterfly, must let go. Before the election last week, I talked to several people and a few pastoral care conversations started with, oh my God, I am so anxious. I am such a mess. What is going to happen? What will we have to let go of next? Well, I think most of us in this room would feel like our team uh, squeaked by. We won pretty well, right? Not always, not in all cases. And so it's easy to let that anxiety kind of go, oh, oh, whew, we got past that one. But still, it comes up again. So being able to let go and be in a place of equanimity for what comes is a practice that many uh, religious traditions teach, and I think it's an important one. Grieving what was before, grieving the way we used to be able to be together before, practicing equanimity, practicing meditation, taking part in stillness, navigating the unknown, claiming companions. We need companions on this journey. Moving on, imagining a way and widening what we trust. How can we trust something that is completely new and different, something we don't even know? And part of it is that we have to do that work of squeezing out of the chrysalis that we have known that binds us into some new possibility that we can't even imagine. I think there's a great deal of climate grief going on, anxiety, climate grief and anxiety. I think it's worthwhile to think about it, be present to it, name it, claim it, talk about it, make plans for it, make plans for what's going to happen. I read a story not long ago about the Guna people of the San Blas Islands off of Panama. These are the indigenous people of Panama and Colombia. And for a decade, they have been making plans for what will happen when they can no longer live on their island. And that time has come. So they're moving inland. They are letting go, grieving, claiming companions, navigating the unknown. All of those things in order to survive. I think we have to think that way. As a congregation, who will we be in 10 years? We don't know yet. But our board is thinking about those kinds of things. Our stewardship team is thinking about those kinds of things. Leadership across the church is thinking about that, the congregation. Who will we be? Will we hold on to what we have been and the way we've always been? Or will we emerge out of something because we must. And what's more exciting? To stay stuck? That's the way it was, we've always done it? I don't get the, the sense that this congregation has ever been, that's the way we've always done it. But the <laughs> idea that we could emerge into something different is exciting, amazing. It is our human nature. I'll close with these words from Karen Herring. Can you feel it? The humming in this story that calls each of us now? Can we listen to the ancient rhythms resounding in the in-between, old instructions for new arrangements, beckoning to us to ask, who are we becoming? In the chaos of great change, what imaginal possibilities are waiting to awaken in you, in me, in us, in the world. Are you, are we willing to let go of what we now know to become something new?
may we have the courage to do so.